Vi har också under de här två dagarna en opinionsbildningskonferens som handlar om vad gränserna går för publicering idag. Och det sänds på SVT Forum. Så vi vill se alla fantastiska talare som vi har här under ett ring i övrigt. Det har varit allt från Thomas Watson och Annette Nova som har pratat om medieutredningen i morgon. Och kommer Niklas Ulenius att prata om politiska aktiver och så vidare och så vidare. Så det är ett tips. Um, så roligt när ni är så många här. Nu ska jag lämna ordet till Anna Pogbaum som är historiker, journalist, journalist i Washington Post, bor i London och i Warszawa. Um, so you're most welcome and please. Thank you very much to the Olin Institute, and thank you to Sophia, who has arranged this um, so beautifully. I am slightly losing my voice, uh, which I think is maybe to do with the weather in Stockholm, which everybody told me was really, really nice, and so I can bring a coat. <laughs> um, I guess I've had bad luck. Uh, but it's always a pleasure to be here um, in, this, in this incredibly beautiful city. Um, and even being in this beautiful city makes me feel sort of bad to start the way I want to start this talk, which is with a note of pessimism. Um, a few months ago, I looked around at uh, the countries that I write the most about. I looked at Central Europe, I looked at Western Europe, I looked at the United States. And I realized that for really the first time in my adult life, I can now see a way in which the institutions that keep these countries together, in the, the countries which I love and which I live in, um, the institutions of the West, might not exist for very much longer. Um, I'm sure that back in the 1950s, when these institutions were new and shaky, people really didn't believe that NATO would work. Uh, they weren't sure what the European Union would be. Uh, maybe in the 1970s, in the era of the Red Brigades and the oil crisis, uh, maybe back then it felt this way too, I don't know. Um, But really, in my adult life, I can't remember a moment as dramatic as this one, um, when I really feel that we're two or three odd elections or bad elections away from the end of NATO, um, the end of the European Union, and maybe the end of the transatlantic alliance, and therefore the liberal world order as we know it. Um, I'll start with the most obvious one. In the United States, um, the Republican Party candidate for president is now Donald Trump. 
Um, and that means that we have to take seriously the possibility of President Donald Trump. Um, right now, it looks like from the polling that Hillary Clinton will win, but of course, her campaign might implode for any number of reasons. Uh, most of them too obvious to rehearse here. She's a, she's a candidate with a long, complicated history. People don't like her. Um, she's, she seems to many people stiff and artificial. Um, anything could happen. It happened in the White House for the first time since the Second World War. A man who is totally uninterested in what Presidents Obama, Bush, Clinton, Reagan, and really Johnson, Nixon, Truman, um, would have called our shared values. Um, Trump advocates torture, mass deportation, religious discrimination. Um, he brags of knowing nothing and caring nothing about the outside world. He has no interest in NATO and its security guarantees. Um, of Europe, he has written, their conflicts are not worth American lives. Pulling back from Europe would save this country millions of dollars annually. And that's something he wrote a few years ago in a book, not something he said on the campaign trail. Um, in any case, it often seems that he prefers the company of dictators to that of other Democrats. You can make deals with those people, he said of Russia. I would have a great relationship with Putin. Not only is Trump uninterested in Americans, American alliances, he would not be capable of sustaining them. Um, in practice, both military and economic unions require not the skills of a property magnate who can make deals, but they require very boring negotiations, unsatisfying compromises, and sometimes the sacrifice of one's own national interest for the greater good. Um, in an era when foreign policy debate has disappeared in most Western countries altogether, um, all of these things are much harder to explain and justify, and they take a talented politician who wants to do it. Um, it's really hard to imagine Trump being able to do that kind of thing at all. Um, but increasingly, it, we here in Europe also see that Americans aren't the only ones who increasingly find their alliances burdensome. Um, a year from now, France also holds a presidential election. Uh, one of the front runners, probably most likely it looks right now to be in the second round, as her father once won, is Marine Le Pen at the National Front. The National Front is usually identified with and being anti-immigrant, um, using very boisterous language about the glory of France and so on, but it's also, uh, it's also a party which has promised to uh, pull France out of NATO, pull France out of the European Union. Um, it all talks about nationalizing French companies, it talks about restricting foreign investment, and it's a very clear view of a France withdrawing from the world, withdrawing from Europe, and withdrawing from NATO. Um, like Trump, Le Pen foresees a special relationship instead with Putin, who is in any case openly funding her election campaign by a, a, a Russian Czech bank. Um, French friends assure me that if she makes it to the second round, then we can count on the center left and the center right uniting against her as they once did against her father. But you know, that's last weekend we saw a very similar election scenario in Austria, and that was a little too close for comfort, uh, if that's what's gonna happen in France. 51% of the Austrians, or maybe it's 50.5%, something like that, did manage to band together against a candidate uh, from the far right. Um, but that was very close. Um, are we sure that's going to happen in France? Um, what if Le Pen's opponent suddenly falls victim to a scandal? What if there's another ISIS attack in Paris? There are all kinds of things that are capable of throwing these very close elections. Um, as we all know, by the time that happens, Britain may be halfway out the door anyway. Um, next month, the British voted a referendum on the European Union. Um, right now, I know that the Remain camp, the stay in Britain camp, looks like it's going to say we'll stay in. But in my view, the vote is still too close to call. Um, I've, I've been in a number of both private and public debates about the, about the European Union um, in Britain in the last few weeks. And I can tell you that the, the campaign which has the most emotion behind it and the most energy and sort of anger and fervor is the Leave campaign. Um, the Leave campaigners are the ones who are upset. They're the ones who, who use emotional arguments. Uh, they're the ones who, in, in private conversation, become angry um, during this debate. Um, and I would therefore not count them out as a, as a force, even, and even if the vote goes, the, goes towards the Remain, um, I wouldn't count them out as a force in British politics in the future. Um, this referendum might not end that debate. Um, if they do vote leave, there are once again a number of possible consequences. There could be copycat referenda in other countries. Um, Viktor Orban in Hungary has spoken of doing that um, exactly himself. 
Um, it's also not hard to imagine the UK then itself eventually drifting away, not just from Europe, but from its other alliances as well. Um, there's a, the mood in Britain is very, um, it's not exactly xenophobic, it's a different, it's something different from that. It's, it's, a, it's a nostalgic um, idea of a Britain, you know, we're an island, we trade with the world, we don't get tangled up in alliances. And, and the, an undertone of that is a questioning even of the American alliance and even of, of, of traditional British security links. And there's certainly a sense that Britain if, you know, has maybe played too big a role in the world recently. Maybe we need to retrench and withdraw. Um, and let's be clear about the consequences of these changes. You know, without France, there is no European Union. There has to be, the whole thing has to be renegotiated. Um, without Britain, um, it's not clear how long NATO lasts either. Um, you know, not everyone will be sorry. Again, as Trump's appealing rhetoric makes clear, the costs of alliances, and he speaks of those the millions of dollars annually, and the short-term sacrifices are easier to see than the long-term goals. And the longer-term gains, the political stability that's created by deterrence and standing armies, the prosperity and the freedom that are created by a shared economic space, um, and even the model that the West presents for the world of successful democracy, open markets, uh, peaceful trade. Uh, these are things that we all take for granted and do take for granted, and of course, we'll go on doing so until they're gone. But how did we get to this moment? Um, let, me, let, me, let me walk back a little bit. You know, how did what seemed like a solid system of political and economic alliances suddenly become so fragile, and where is the anger against them coming from? Um, I don't think there's one answer to this question. Um, I think it's, and I don't think it's quite the same question for every country, I don't think it functions in the same way. But I thought today is a beginning of a conversation, which I'll then continue with my colleague, Peter uh, Waldarski. Um, I thought I would throw out some ideas. Um, this, you know, maybe he and I can get to some of the solutions and some of the answers, but I think it's very important before we do that to talk about what, um, what some of the causes are. Um, first, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the economic crisis of 2008 and, its, and the ramifications it had um, down the road. You know, at the time that it happened, the American government and the British government and a number of other governments um, felt, what, as, as their initial response, felt the need to bail out their banking systems. Um, we all understand why this was. You know, if the banking system collapsed, the whole economy might collapse. Um, but as the years passed, you know, the banking systems were bailed out, bankers returned to their jobs, at least some of them. But the impression many people had was that bankers were rescued, while many ordinary Americans, this is certainly true in the United States, lost their homes. Um, bankers were rescued, and then in Britain, you know, others suffered from the recession that followed. There was no compensation for them. Um, this is the resentment, of course, that produced the Occupy Wall Street movement, and it has also fueled support for the anti-establishment candidacies um, of both Trump as well as Bernie Sanders in the United States. The, the, the 2008 crisis also had another impact, um, I think both inside the West, and particularly on the periphery of the West, but also around the world, is that it took away the aura of Western success and the, and the feeling that, if nothing else, the West is competent. Um, and if this aura of success and competence was, of course, already undermined by the Iraq War, um, which, which created the impression of the United States you know, acting rashly and then not following up, not, not understanding what the consequences would be. Um, and in, in a number of countries, it, 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 even inside the West, it, it cast doubts on American leadership, but also on uh, the very idea that, um, that, our, that our interlocked banking systems, our interlocking economies, that this is bringing us all prosperity. Um, it was actually in the wake of 2008 that Viktor Orban in Hungary gave his famous speech, in which he talked about the decline of the West and the need for a new order, and he used this expression, illiberal democracy. You know, maybe we need a different kind of democracy, maybe this old-fashioned democracy that we, we thought we were going to get isn't going to work anymore in the future. Um, and he, he, he used that expression, for, for, and that was very, people didn't notice at the time, but it was very specifically related to the, to the 2008 um, crisis. Um, the second issue that, that comes up frequently in conversation is immigration. Um, and this is another obvious cause of distress, but I think this topic also needs to be picked apart because, of course, there are real immigration problems, um, and then there are also imaginary ones. Um, and sometimes in some countries, and I, I can't speak for Sweden, but I'd be interested to hear afterwards how it works here, 
Um, in some countries, immigration functions as a, as a sort of substitute for another kind of conversation. Um, you know, let me explain. Immigration is actually going down in the United States. There's less illegal immigration than there was before. Uh, the numbers are dropping. Um, and I think actually in the last several years, certainly since 2008 they dropped, but even more recently they continue to drop. Um, immigration has always been connected to the U.S. economy, U.S. economic growth. And when, in the years when there wasn't growth, it was, it was lower. Um, but I suspect in the U.S. stronger feelings about, about immigration are connected to other things. Um, one of them may be uh, that we may be seeing in the U.S. a backlash against the first black president. Um, I think it's not an accident that Obama's victory has never been accepted as legitimate uh, by a surprisingly large proportion of the population. Um, to many people, his election seemed to reverse the traditional order of things, you know, as if somehow white Americans were losing their leading position. Um, Trump has at times in an open way and at times in a coded way appealed very directly to the sense of racial anger. You know, the whites are losing, where our numbers are shrinking. Um, there, and there are a number of states in the United States where, of course, this is already true. Um, one of them is California, another one is Florida, where the, um, it's, it was described to me last week actually by Governor Jeb Bush, who I happened to see um, at an event in Europe. Um, who talked about states that have a majority minority population, and there are now several of them. Um, you know, it, it, the, the sense of order being destroyed, the sense of something being lost, this is something that's being appealed to directly by, um, by calls for a halt on immigration. It's not only about the immigrants themselves, it's not only about a threat to jobs, it's also about a kind of more, um, you know, a more metaphorical threat to, to, to tradition. Um, in Europe, again, there's a similar issue. Uh, although in Europe, I really think there's a special, there's a special case, a special case of Islam and terrorism, um, because of the growth of radical Islam and radical uh, Islamic movements in some European countries. The impression is easily created that, um, you know, immigrants are bringing these things to us. That you know, people coming from Syria are going to bring those problems that we see they have over there, and they'll bring them into our countries and upset our countries. Whether this is true or false um, doesn't really matter. This is the impression that compared, this is the feeling that people have. Uh, one of the most fascinating, uh, we were just discussing it with Sophie, one of the most fascinating um, uh, sort of twists of the immigration story has been the number of countries in Central and Eastern Europe which actually don't have any Muslim immigrants, um, which have nevertheless been, it's turned out that politicians in some of those countries have been able to use the immigration issue anyway. Um, Poland is an example. There are no immigrants in Poland. I mean, okay, there's a handful. Um, the few immigrants that came over the last decade or so, including from Chechnya uh, and including from other Islamic countries, have all integrated very well. I mean, they're, they're not particularly noticed. There was no problem with them. There was no issue. Um, but in our last election campaign, the, um, the, 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 the ruling the country, the party, which is now the ruling party, it used the, the prospect of immigration, of, of Islamicization, and of Islamic radicalism. Look, this is something that's happening in Paris. This is something that's happening in Brussels. We don't want that here. It's very important that we protect ourselves against that. This is a new line. This was not part of this was not part of political debate in Poland until until very recently. But this is also a um, it's also a new factor. Um, I think there's a final issue to do with immigration, which was. Um, when we go back and analyze what Chancellor Merkel did last summer, um, I, at the time, empathized very much with her feelings as a German, um, as her, you know, Germany itself was a country of emigres, a country of refugees after the war. Um, you know, she and many people she knew were, were refugees who were helped in one way or another by, um, by the German state. Um, West Germany has a sense of itself as having been the country that accepted refugees from Eastern Germany. Um, and they see that experience as having been very successful. Um, nevertheless, what she did by announcing unilaterally that she would open Germany's borders is she created another impression, which we hadn't had in Europe for a long time, which is that Germany is deciding for us. You know, they made the decision, and now everybody else is going to have to adjust to it. And again, it's, it's, I know that it's a little bit false, and it's not, it doesn't explain fully what happened. Um, it, the refu you know, refugees were coming anyway, people were arriving anyway, something had to be done with them. She made a, her practical suggestion was let's get them out of Greece and move them into richer countries that are able to take care of them. So, but despite all the pragmatic arguments for what she was doing, 
the impression was cast in other places, um, certainly, in, certainly in Central Europe, but I think also in, in Britain and France. Um, the impression was cast that, that Merkel is making a decision and we all have to accept it. And that was one of the first, that was a challenge both to the idea of European decision making, European foreign policy decision making, and it also um, emphasized this feeling that we are losing control, that order is being upset. Um, and that leads me to the third issue, which is behind some of this anxiety, and which I think is in some ways um, the deeper issue, and that's the issue of globalization itself. Um, people feel nowadays an odd sense of loss of control. You know, you can be working in a factory in northern England, and you can learn that your factory will be closed because of a decision that somebody made in China. Um, you can be working on a, on a um, you know, on a, on a fishing boat in France, and you can learn that your fish prices will be different because of a decision made somewhere on the other side of the world. Um, people have, globalization, which was celebrated very much when it, when it, when it began to pick up pace, um, famously by Tom Friedman in his book, The World is Flat, when it began to pick up pace and when it began, became clear how the speed with which the international economy was integrating, um, has also been building up to a backlash for a long time. Um, the backlash manifests itself in you know, calls for borders, calls for walls, calls for, um, calls for withdrawing from the EU and international organizations, but I think it really does represent a real sense of people have a lack of control. Um, the, real, the problem, of course, is that leaving international institutions and leaving, leaving the EU, uh, or certainly not leaving NATO, won't fix the problem. Um, and that what we really need to do is work together to find ways to, to uh, bring a sense of security back to people. Um, and because undoing globalization, picking it apart, isn't really possible anymore. Um, nevertheless, the, 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 fun, the underlying problem, the underlying anxiety, uh, I think has been there for a long time, but it's really now only building up to fruition. Uh, there's another big change, um, which is sort of the elephant in the room at this conference about journalism and news, um, that I think has been underestimated um, as a change, and this is affecting all Western societies, and is also an explanation for why these kinds of things are all happening all across the West, and that's changes to culture. Um, and by, the, by which I mean pop culture as well as media culture. Um, let me start with the United States. Uh, famously, Ronald Reagan was a, pro a product of Hollywood. He was a Hollywood actor. He was um, somebody who loved Hollywood. He was also somebody who really imbibed and, and tried to portray and sort of believed in Hollywood values. And what were Hollywood values? Hollywood values were, um, you know, the good defeats evil, the, the, the white hat defeats the black hat, um, the good cowboy rides into the town and gets, clears out the bad people, um, the, the good, the nice man gets the girl, you know, there's a happy ending. And those things sound a little bit simplistic, but they were very much that if you look back at how he spoke and what he did um, in his, both as a, as a, as a governor and as president, he very much lived these values. And of course, people responded to those values because they were going to those movies. You know, those were the values of Hollywood in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, and Reagan, during, you know, Reagan's appeal was to people who also wanted the world to look that way. Um, Hollywood isn't what it used to be, and people don't watch um, John Wayne Western movies anymore. Um, what, is the, what, is the most, uh, what is the most powerful and most popular, one of the most popular art forms at the time? Well, it's reality television. Um, what is Donald Trump, actually? He's a reality television star. How did he, be, how did he come to national television? How did, he, how did he come to national popularity and fame? Through his program, The Apprentice. Um, through his acting, you know, these, these real life, you know, um, these, these scenarios, which people found funny and amusing. He is an embodiment of this particular art form, and he acts like, he acts like a reality television character. How do you win on reality television? You win by being the loudest, the most vulgar, uh, the person who attracts the most attention, and the person who also slightly makes fun of the whole format itself. So when he's playing at running president, he's also laughing at running president, you know. I'm running for president, but I can say incredibly vulgar things about everybody. I'm running for president, but I can insult my party. I'm running for president, but I can say awful things about women, I can say awful things about Mexicans, um, I can say awful things about Muslims. That's a reality television gambit. Um, that's what people do to attract attention, attract viewers, and win popularity. 
Uh, people see him doing that, and that's what they've been watching, and they find it appealing. Um, I actually think when I started to think about Trump in this context, I also started to think about some of the other far left and far right and kind of, they're called joke candidates in a lot of politicians in a lot of countries in Europe. And you can see a similar phenomenon. Beppe Grillo in Italy actually is a comedian who became a politician. Uh, Poland has a politician called Pavel Kukiz, who's a rock star. Um, same, but same kind of attitude. Attack the, attack the establishment, use the language of rock musicians, you know, try and win the youth vote that way. Um, Geert Wilders in the Netherlands, very, very similar tactic, very similar kind of joking, sarcasm. Um, again, this is something that people recognize from, from watching on television, from watching uh, contemporary movies. Um, to some extent, Boris Johnson in the UK plays the same role. These are politicians who function as entertainers, and they're familiar to people and they appeal to people because they're doing what entertainers do um, in contemporary culture. And I think the degree to which that's helping them win elections and helping them attract support is something that hasn't really been, hasn't been um, understood. Um, secondly, there's a change in, there's been a change in information culture and news <coughs> culture. And this is also true all across the West. Um, we were discussing just now the death or the attacks on what used to be called the mainstream media. Um, you know, though, though rightly condemned for smugness and predictability some of the time, large newspapers and important broadcasters did once have an important role to play in Western societies. They served as a filter, uh, they eliminated conspiracy theory from debates, um, they created the possibility of a national conversation. Uh, once upon a time, everybody in the United States watched the same news programs at 6 o'clock. Everybody sat down at the same time, watched the news, and they had the same information. Um, that meant, even if they agreed or disagreed with what was being said, at least the next day, they could discuss the same facts. Um, obviously, this also had its drawbacks. It limited the field of discussion, but there were also advantages. Um, now we live in a completely different kind of world. <coughs> People not only disagree in their opinions about what happened yesterday, they disagree about what happened. And you put them out side by side, and you can click on issues, I don't know, terrorism, Hillary Clinton, and you can see what the feed is saying about those issues at any given moment. And of course, it's stunning. You know, click on Hillary Clinton on the right wing news feed, you'll see scandal, um, uh, stories about her husband's love affairs, and so on. You know, on the right hand, on the left hand side, you'll see a completely different set of issues. Same is true for the economy. Same is true for terrorism. Same is true for all kinds of things. So that's that's um, the right wing news feed. <laughs> um, you know, there are a few exceptions to this. And sorry, and I should say that this is happening at a time when. The, the mainstream media, not only does it, uh, does it not reach people anymore, it's also been weakened very much. Its business model doesn't really work anymore. Um, there are many countries in which there isn't really, uh, there isn't strong uh, kind of central media at all. Uh, many smaller countries, uh, particularly in Central Europe and not only, no longer have powerful central medias with, you know, with trained reporters who do, um, who do investigations and who can, have, who can conduct serious policy discussions. A lot of places that have disappeared. And what you're left with instead is people receiving news, often from their friends, um, and which is a, a fact which enables them to live in completely separate um, worlds. Um, an example from the US campaign, um, one of the most shocking things that Trump said during the campaign was that on the day of 9-11, on the day of the attack on the US World Trade Center, thousands of Muslims stood on the other side of the river in New Jersey and cheered while the World Trade Center burned. Um, that's actually not true. Um, it didn't happen, there's no evidence for it. Um, but if you go to certain parts of the internet, you could easily find articles on those Muslim crowds cheering after 9-11. Um, and then you can be part of a Twitter feed, a Facebook page, or an email group in which everyone else thinks they know about this ch groups of cheering Muslims and people who are repeating this message. Um, and you can live in a world in which everyone around you agrees that there were thousands of people cheering in the streets all day. There's no way to disprove it. Um, social media now allows people to live in separate realities. Um, and this too is very important for understanding the rise of populism. That there are, there are, you, it is now possible to construct a set of facts which don't bear any relationship to what actually happened, um, and to conduct whole political campaigns um, on that basis. Um, let, me, let me throw in one final thought. 
Um, the final thought is about something I was, I was, it occurred to me a couple of days ago. I was reading a book about a memoir for, about the Bolshevik Revolution. And I was reading it for a book I'm writing, and I didn't expect, I was actually flipping through it rather quickly, looking for information. I wasn't reading it very carefully. And as I was reading, the prose drew me in. Um, partly because I, it reminded me of the energy of revolution. You know, the, the, you know the, the, how boring the status quo can be. How ordinary life can begin, for many people, to seem dull. Um, how, what is the appeal of revolutionary politics? You know, we've all assumed for so many years, certainly since the Second World War ended, that, you know, peace is better, that stability is good, that, you know, that, that an economy, that, that a pol politics which are mostly designed to encourage economic growth and increase prosperity, that this is what most people want. Um, but there's another part of human nature um, which finds, you know, the idea of a business-friendly left trading places with a pragmatic center-right boring. Um, you know, an idea that this kind of status quo <coughs> politics doesn't really give people some of the things that they want. Um, and the reading the revolution, the, the history of the revolution, brought me back to a famous essay by George Orwell, um, who wrote a review of Mein Kampf, actually, that was published uh, during the war in the 1940s. And I think I'm going to close quoting this review, because I think it, it, it's a reminder of a part of human nature and a part of the sort of political cycle that we've forgotten. Um, Orwell's writing about Mein Kampf, which he's reading, and he's gone through all the reasons why it's a ridiculous book. You know, it's based on conspiracy theories, made-up stories, false history, you know, why it's appalling, and you know, why, um, why people should, you know, should, you know, why it's good to fight Hitler, essentially. But then he, he makes this point. He said, the one thing about, about Hitler is that he has, he has grasped the falsity of the hedonistic attitude to life. And so he says, nearly all Western thought since the last war, he was talking about World War I, certainly all progressive thought has assumed tacitly that human beings desire nothing beyond ease, security, and the avoidance of pain. You know, in such a view of life, there's no room for patriotism and military virtues. You know, the socialist who finds his children playing with soldiers is usually upset, but he's never able to think of a substitute for the tin soldiers. Tin pacifists won't do. <laughs> Hitler, because in his own joyless mind, he feels it with exceptional strength, knows that human beings don't only want comfort, safety, short working hours, hygiene, birth control, and in general common sense. They also, at least intermittently, want struggle and self-sacrifice, not to mention drums, flags, and loyalty parades. You know, whereas socialism, this is Orwell, socialism and even capitalism in a more grudging way have said to people, I offer you a good time, Hitler has said to them, I offer you struggle, danger, and death. And as a result, a whole nation flings itself at his feet. So, Keeping that in mind, there are there is a part of human nature that wants revolution, that wants to overturn the established order, and wants something to live for that's bigger than, um, you know, the, bigger than an argument about whether GDP goes up one percent or down two percent next year. Uh, I think that's part of what's driving the current mood, uh, and of course it's the part of it that that our our current rulers and our current politicians really need to find an answer to. Thank you very much.
two uh, distinguished writers, but you know, when it comes to politicians, journalists, um, a lot of people who were uh, very respected um, in the old days are not as respected today. Um, I think the, the first step, it, it was really interesting to listen to you because I think the first step in order to reverse these, these trends that are really global, we discussed, we have a national conversation here, there's a national conversation in the US, in the UK, everywhere, but basically these trends are shared. Uh, so, so there is not a national problem, but there is a national problem, but it's really a problem for the entire Western world. Um, and I think the key word is what you said is the sense of, I think, sense of that something is missing, a sense of loss, a sense of uh, that we don't have control over things. Uh, and, and you need really to understand that in order to have solutions to the problems. Uh, I mean, one of the things that the Germans, the West, West Germany at least, understood after the Second World War and after the experience of Nazi Germany was the importance of stability. Because they've gone through, they, they went through extremely turbulent times in the 30s, and in the 20s and the 30s. And then without that, they would not have been able to, to gain support and become, become the leader of Germany, and then destroy, almost destroy Europe. So they created, basically what they did was to create institutions that would safeguard Germany from, uh, Germany from chaos. Uh, and to put, the, uh, put stability at the forefront. So, so when people ask, well, why are the Germans obsessed by stability? Why are they talking about price stability, about all those things, about all, all of them? <laughs> it's because of history. Because they understand what chaos can bring, uh, and what chaos can unleash. So if we, if we go back to the end of the Cold War, to what you said, the end of history, what Francis Fukuyama was talking about, and that liberalism has finally become the ideology for everyone. And, and then we fast forward to seven, eight years. What happened? It started actually it started in Russia with the financial crisis in Russia in the 90s. Uh, and chaos, what, what did chaos do with Russia? Financial chaos do with Russia in the 90s. It destroyed democracy, all the starting points of democracy in Russia, and it brought Vladimir Putin to power. Then we had 9-11 in 2001, uh, and the start of the wars in first in Afghanistan and, and Iraq, and, and the major failure in, in Iraq and the chaos in the Middle East. Then we had a financial crisis in 2008-2009. We had a euro crisis in, what was that? Exactly. So, many, so many dramatic things happening over the last 15 years, major shocks to our systems, that people, I, and this is my experience, that people started to have doubts about this order. Uh, and if you combine that with globalization, which, which brings a lot of wealth, a lot of freedoms, but it also adds to the sense of lack of control. It's lack of sense that someone else is deciding your destiny. Uh, you combine that with the forces of digitalization, which is in, in the business that we are in, um, journalism, uh, basically that companies in Silicon Valley are deciding your future, taking away jobs from you, um, creating enormous possibilities, but at the same time creating problems. And you don't control it on a national level. I think that is um, really uh, really creating the grounds for demagogues and people who come up with not solutions but can point fingers and say, say that this system is broken. This system is broken. Liberalism has failed. Which is, I mean, ironically, even even given the even given the financial shocks, even given the recession, um, in many parts of Europe, certainly the United States. Uh, it's it's still not the case that you have people living in mass poverty. You know, you, you know, you compare the present to the '30s, uh, and the standards of living are still far higher than they were, you know, in the last century. Um, even even given everything that's that's happened, that's negative. Um, so you also have to ask yourself whether what's happening isn't isn't you know, you, people talk a lot about the economic causes, the economic sources of of populism and demagoguery. 
Uh, but given that it happens even in some countries, for example, Poland, which objectively speaking was richer than it was, has, is right now richer than it was ever, um, you need to look at some of the cultural explanations as well. And I think you're right. I think it's, as, as I said before, I think it's to do with the loss of control, um, the sense of losing national identity, the sense of a certain kind of order being overturned, um, and the sense of, and a fear of foreign influences, uh, which I think are all very powerful in most Western countries. You could actually also combine it with a back, it's, it is a backlash against globalization in a sense. Uh, but I think it's also, a, it's, it's, it's also, as you say, a cultural backlash uh, that has to do with gender equality, gay rights. I mean, you see this, you look at Russia, and many of the things happening in Russia, that has happened in Russia over the years have now started to come to Western Europe as well. Which is, of course, also not accidental. Not that Russia promotes these things. Exactly. Right. But, but, but almost all of the demagogic, um, both far right and far left movements in the West have Russian connections, and in some cases, very open Russian. Yeah, but I, I would guess that in the next wave, we will see attacks on gender equality, for example. We will see attacks on gay rights. Things that we have sort of taken for granted. Um, that will become more prevalent. Uh, but as, as you said, I mean, if you just look at the economy, you look at the objective facts, it's not about that, I think. It's about the perception. Uh, and you can say that perception is not right, it's wrong, but still, people have the perception that the elites, I think Martin Wolf wrote this in the Financial Times today, and I think really, he's really pointing at something important, that the elites, the sense is that the elites have failed in a, with the financial crisis, with the incompetence, with the Iraq war, with all the things that have happened in the euro crisis in Europe, which is important, the refugee crisis added to this perception uh, that there was, when, when Merkel said that our, our border is open, I think many people feel that, so who is in charge of this? Trump is saying this, was all, Trump was saying this all the time. What the hell is going on? We need to find out what the hell is going on. So he's actually, that is the feeling that he points out. Who's in charge? But who is, um, what happened with the defense of the open liberal society? Pointing out all the good things that have actually happened. I mean, I'm, I'm expecting that will happen. Um, you, know, you know, the Austrian election was won partly on those grounds last week. You know, the, 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 those who defended the existing order and who kind of wanted to find something good to say about it rallied behind this very unlikely candidate. Um, this 73 year old green politician who's the son of. Um, of white Russian immigrants, actually. Um, so it, it can happen. People can be galvanized. Um, but what was scary about that election is that it came so close um, to going the other way. Um, you know, it may be that people need to feel even more threatened. It may be that they need to see, feel physically something slipping away before they begin to fight back for it. Um, that's, of course, what worries me. Because it's only when things are gone, when you lose um, when you lose your institution, <coughs> you lose your traditions, that you begin to notice how important they are. Service, I've, I've seen service showing that the people who actually support Trump and similar politicians, they have a larger, you can really see that they, there is a level of threat that they feel. They feel threatened. Mm -hmm. And they react oh, no, more. I think it's real. Yeah, yeah, and they react more to different kinds of threats. Uh, refugee, perceived threat, threats from refugees. Uh, from economic shocks, whatever, they feel vulnerable. Um, and they look for some kind of authoritarian solution. Uh, that is also an explanation why authoritarianism is on the rise, because maybe this has to do a lot with authoritarianism. Uh, someone that just say things in a straight way, don't want to have a complex discussion, nuances, uh, you liberals, you always, I mean, pros and cons, stop. Stop with that nonsense. I have the answer. That is the Trump way of doing, doing business. Yeah, no, no, as somebody pointed out recently, you know, in English there's, there's a saying about uh, a computer program, but um, somebody said, well, maybe Trump's authoritarianism isn't a problem, it's not a bug, it's a feature. It's a feature, not a bug. In other words, people are voting for him not despite his authoritarian language, but because of it. 
Um, but this is, this is the point I made at the end of my talk. You know, we underestimate the degree to which people do find that appealing. I mean, because we haven't heard it, it hasn't been part of mainstream debate. For the most part, there's even some exceptions in American history. But because we haven't heard it much since 1945, we forget how appealing it is. Um, at a time when everything seems very complicated to have somebody cut through and say, I'm going to dispense with courts, I'm going to dispense with long conversations, I'm going to dispense with debate and just do it, whatever it is. Um, there, that's very appealing. That always has been. In certain times, some of that. In certain times. In times of instability. Exactly. In times of uncertainty. In times of vulnerability. Because when things are stable, people don't look for that kind of answer. Uh, but certainly now, people, I think a lot of people feel threatened in different ways, but they, there is this sense of that we are vulnerable. And don't underestimate what I also mentioned, which is that you know, people get bored. Yeah. You know, particularly, I think, you know, the collapse of communism um, had a very strong impact even on, the, even on the Western left. And it made the argument for certain kinds of revolutionary solutions silly. I mean, um, at least until they've recently been revived. But there was a long period of time when we had the, the rise of Tony Blair, um, the Clintons. We had these kind of, as I said, business-friendly, centrist left, um, and which was trading places with a kind of business-friendly, pragmatic, central right. Um, and this kind of politics, you know, Tory versus Labour, Democrat versus Republican, when all these candidates seemed very similar, um, it took the passion out of politics. Um, and the idea that there could be revolutionary change, you know, and the return even to some Marxist ideas, uh, which was one of the things I find most extraordinary, uh, often coming out of the mouths of the far right, um, has an appeal. You know, we can overturn the neoliberal, um, you know, globalization system. We can fight back against it. We can we can put walls back up against our around our borders. We can we can have this revolutionary change. It'll make us all happier. This is a this is an appeal. You can you can argue all you want um, that this is a you know it's a it's a it's it's you know it's not a way to wealth you know protectionism creates poverty. This is how you slow economic growth. This is how you kill jobs. You can say it and say it and say it. But some people will always find the appeal of the revolution um, stronger. I think actually, by the way, that's part of what's at play in the Britain debate about Europe. I mean, it's a it's a, it's in, it's not a it's not that dramatic. It's not about the. It's not a debate about the nature of the country or the constitution of the country. But the, the Leave campaign, the power of the Leave campaign is about, let's overthrow this. Let's start again. Let's have a revolutionary change. Let's wipe out everything that we've done and start from scratch and think about again about what kind of country we want to be. And there are people who find that appealing rather than just the same old boring David Cameron, um, you know, David Cameron, David Miliband, Ed Miliband um, exchange. You mentioned Marxist ideas, and you have pointed out in one of your columns that uh, we don't see uh, extreme right in Europe. We, we have, you know, we have, we're seeing a nationalist, socialistic movement with the extreme right yeah, and I, I, extreme I left, that, you know, combined. I've always found the expression far right annoying. Uh, it's an expression you have to use as a kind of shortcut when you're writing because. Otherwise, people don't know what you mean, and you don't have three sentences to explain it. Um, but, but, the, but the far has never been, um, it's not on the same spectrum as, uh, as establishment parties. That's one of the reasons why it's different. Um, and most of the far right parties now, some of them have changed recently, including the Freedom Party. The Freedom Party was originally sort of under Jörg Haider, was kind of talked a lot about capitalism, was very close to business in Austria. It's now changed its rhetoric quite dramatically, and it uses rhetoric which used to be called far left. I mean, it's, again, um, anti-trade, um, pro-protectionism, and again, pro-state, pro pro-national industry. I mean, it's changed very much the way it speaks, and some of its language, just like some of Marine Le Pen's language, um, some of the Polish government's language is, I mean, it, it could come right out of sort of 1970s, Marxism. Yeah. But they, I think those parties, they adjust. So in the, in the 80s, when they were really business friendly, that was the era of Thatcher and Reagan. I mean, you remember all the New Democracy here in Sweden, the democracy. They were very business friendly at the start of their, their era as, as a party in Sweden as well. And then in the 90s, with the refugee, the first refugee crisis we had in the United States, they started to talk about refugees. 
and they started to all talk about the Islamic threat, started to stop talking about businesses creating jobs and about lowering taxes. So these parties adjust to the flavor of, of the day. Um, so the Freedom Party could actually change its politics if they feel that there is a demand for something well, different. Right now they're very flexible. Right. <laughs> I mean, no, but there are also a number of interesting far left, far right alliances in Europe. The yeah. Greek government, everybody talks about Syriza, which is a far left party, but it's actually a coalition with a far right party. And I'm using these words as a very general one. Uh, but the, the relationships between them and the links between them are quite clear. They don't have any problem cooperating. <coughs> National, nationalism is the ideology that binds these parties together. Often, yes. Very often. Um. Mm, and you have written a lot about Russia, and we know that Putin is working with disinformation as well to uh, affect the European Union and so forth. Um, how should we deal with that? I mean, how, how, are you, how, how are you dealing with this as a military chief? It's, it's, it's very difficult, and you wrote a column about this recently, about you know, all these fact-checkers that are online. We don't have that many in, in Sweden, but, but in the US they are prevalent. Uh, but although you have the fact-checkers, the lies continue to be spread. Uh, it's, it's a growth in conspiracy thinking. It's, 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 I think this is a disease. And it's a threat. It's a real threat to this. This is a direct product of the way the internet works and the way that people get their news. That that's what, this is coming from yeah, the structure and, of. And the Wall Street uh, Journal example of showing two different news feeds from Facebook, one one far left, one far right, and and how the conversation is sort of mass Yeah, no relationship. No relationship at all, and, and truth is not at the center of the conversation. But but that that also makes it very easy to manipulate. Extreme. Uh, another another feature of online journalism and online um, and, and social media is the role of anonymity. Um, it's now unbelievably easy to well more than easy. It's very it's done every day to set up as an anonymous poster and to begin working on Twitter and Facebook and begin um, and begin trying to shape conversations. And this is done now professionally. I mean the Russians have these so-called troll farms, you know, buildings where you know hundreds of people work. Uh, whose job is all day long to post comments. They, of course, they do it in Russia, but they, we know they do it in Western countries as well. Um, there was a recent uh, New York Times, a few months ago, uh, wrote an article describing um, describing a very strange incident in Louisiana where there was a staged, kind of online, there was sudden news about a chemical, a chemical factory accident. It was supposedly creating pollution in, in Louisiana, and the there was there was there were fake news reports. There were even fake videos with journalists saying telling false false information. There was a Twitter and Facebook campaign attached to it, um, and then of course within an hour or so, it was people worked out that it was a hoax. Um, the origins of this campaign, this strange online campaign, were traced back to Russia. Um, the interesting question is why was that done and for what purpose? And the best guess that people have is that it was an experiment. You know, can we create false reality in the American internet? Can we create a totally fake event? They've done that several times. And they've done it in other places too. And of course you can imagine how easy it would be in the case of a real catastrophe, um, a real chemical accident or a race riot, you know, or a um, you know, a terrorist attack. You can see how easy it would be to add to the panic and create more hysteria, if that's what you were trying to do. Um, this, the, this online world is very, very easy to manipulate. Um, and of course, it's done not only by the Russians. Um, very famously, Trump now uses, um, so, uh, Trump uses computer bots. These are, these are computer programs that, that post fake Twitter, that he creates millions of fake Twitter accounts and fake Facebook accounts, which tweet and, and report fake information. Um, something like half of his Twitter followers, he has, I don't know, 20 million followers, something like half of them are probably these computer bots which he's bought um, in order to pump up his numbers. And this, you know, actually all campaigns do it now. Um, I don't know about how it's sweet, but certainly you as a... There is a real following as well. There's a real following so, as well, but I'm just saying that the, yeah. the but techniques, can, the can techniques manipulate. of manipulating online information um, are now out there. People are using them. Um, and I don't think 
most people are very conscious of how it works. And I, I, I drew attention recently to the, to the Russian case, because the Russians have been doing this actively for a number of years. They operate in most European countries. Um, and in some places, very successful at convincing people um, of things that aren't true. And it's, it's something that the mainstream media needs to be more aware of and needs to push back against. As we said before, many things start in Russia. Mm -hmm. So you need to look carefully on, on the things that they are doing. I, th I think in, in terms of what we can do as journalistic institutions, I, uh, it's very difficult, but we, we do need to uphold our standards um, and not be drawn into this kind of opinion journalism where you have your opinion, I have my opinion, we do the reporting in the way uh, that has been at, at the core of our institution on how we do journalism and to stick to that. Uh, and then, of course, our audience need to be much more aware of the things that are happening, the, tro the, troll, the troll fabrics, all of that. And I think in Sweden, actually, we have a pretty good conversation on this. Uh, so the problem is not as big as it is in, in many other countries, but it's, it's a real problem, and it might become bigger. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? I'm pretty pessimistic. Um, the other, the other night, I, before I went to sleep, I was actually, what was going on in my, my head was that I was really worried about Trump, Donald Trump becoming president, which is crazy. Keeps you awake at night. Yeah, it keeps me awake at night. I, I've never uh, had that experience before with, the, with the thinking about an election with someone, uh, that I'm worried that someone might become president in, in a democracy, or someone might become prime minister in a democracy. Of course, I can have my opinion, I prefer that kind of thing, before that kind of thing. But, but I really felt worried about it. Uh, and I felt worried about it uh, for the last six months. Uh, I started to worry about this in November. Uh, and when I first wrote about it here in Sweden, I made people react and say, well, why do you write about this Trump thing? It's silly. Uh, but um, the feeling from the very start was that he writes on something that is real. And it would be very difficult to stop him, I think. Um, with an, because you need an effective counter candidate. And the problem is that Hillary Clinton is not the ideal candidate. There are so many things in her past and the Clinton's past. I think she's great in many ways. So that's, uh, there are so many things that you can throw at her, <coughs> and they will. They will trash her. And that I really the advantage that Hillary has is there's really almost nothing you can tell me about her that I don't already know. In that sense. Just wait. And there's no, I mean, there's no they can make what scandal up. could you, you, okay, even if you made it up, what, what could stick to her after after so many years in public life? I mean, it's in a way an advantage. But actually, maybe Bernie Sanders would <coughs> be a more effective candidate than Hillary Clinton, although I don't prefer him. Prefer him. But uh, I, I really worry that Hillary Clinton will not be able to win the election. So, um, in that sense, when you ask me if I'm pessimistic, I am, because it's very. It's Huge difference if Austria elects a right wing president. Austria is a small country. What Austria does, of course, is tragic. They elect someone who is a nationalist and, and wants to basically uh, withdraw Austria from the democratic world. <laughs> that is not what he has said, but, but all the things that he suggests point in that direction. If you compare that to the US, which is the leader of the democratic world, so if the U.S. elects someone, if, it, if the U.S. elects Trump, where are we supposed to go in a real crisis? Are you pessimistic or optimistic? So I don't really want to be pessimistic, but I find myself stuck with it, yeah. <laughs> I suppose you have questions as well. Anyone optimistic here? Let's hear from an optimist. Maybe this is part of the problem. We all feel so pessimistic. So it's difficult to Please sort of... They are passionate and we are pessimistic. Thank you very much. Hawke uh, Nilsson, Halvarsson, Halvarsson. Uh, how much of the pessimism and of the dangerous uh, events happening now would you put on the account that liberalism and the free society has been successful enough to be the thing that everyone wants to work. Um, that's actually, I think, a lot of it. That was the point I was making at the end of my talk. That you know, we are 
we became successful, we created wealthy societies, we created prosperity, um, and now people are bored. And people want it to change, people want the next thing to happen. Um, I think that's, that's very important, and, and, and also, because we are perceived outside, you know, because the West is perceived as the rich world, um, this attracts a lot of sort of jealousy and anger from everywhere else as well. I mean, what, what is the, that's part of what the inspiration for Islamic, the Islamic movements are very profoundly anti-Western for exactly that reason. There's an, there's an anger at, you know, the established Western successful world and a desire to destroy that success, you know, with, a, with for, for dubious reasons. But I think that's, I think it's very important. The, the, the fact of success, the fact that we have been successful, um, is part of our problem, and that is the irony at this moment, that the, you know, the so-called establishment is now the, um, you know, is now the thing that people want to, when people want to move something, they want to change something, this is what they want to overturn. What's the next thing? You've had democracy, you've had freedom, you've had open borders, you've had free trade, um, you've had prosperity, you know, if you're dissatisfied with that, what do you want? You want to overturn it, what's the alternative? The alternative is dictatorship. Look, liberalism created social media, the most effective tool of ISIS. I'm not against social media, but you need to realize, but you really to, to need to realize certain things. So, so this is basically what we see also, and we just touched on it, but let me just add it, a shifting power equation. I think Moshe Znaim has, has a great, it made a great point in his book, The End of Power. It's just one sentence, which I think summarizes everything. So the power has not been, never been as easy to obtain, never been so difficult to exercise power, and never been so easy to lose power. And this sort of summarizes many things. Uh, if, you, if, you, if, if you think about our politicians, our national politicians here in Sweden, it's really difficult to be in government. At the same time, it's so easy to create a Facebook group. It's so easy to get thousands of likes on Facebook that attacks the government. And the expectations are really high. Look at the, the, how people are really too disappointed about the revenue the government, maybe for real reasons, but also for some reasons that are not, I think, fair. And with globalization, with, look at the entire refugee crisis, it's very difficult to act on a national level. So you're exposed to all these forces. And you can really easily lose power. Also, Romson is a perfect example of that. And then the, the, the mismatch between the expectations from the electorate, the ordinary citizen, and the politician's ability to actually solve the problems, that, I think it creates almost a perfect storm for populists. And this is true in, in, in all societies. Uh, Matthias Svensson, on, on my own, um, so no affiliation. Uh, I, I wonder about <coughs> the future. Uh, haven't we lost it uh, on the liberal side? Uh, you talk about the institutions uh, that were, in, in a very nostalgic way. And I'm obsessing about history myself. I go back to the Thatcher days, and oh, wasn't it lovely? We were reforming back then. But what, what are we going to do? Uh, with the future, uh, and haven't, uh, isn't the problem that we've been afraid of it. Uh, we don't know what we want to do, how we want a better EU, how we want a better NATO. Uh, we, we lean back and, and uh, pretend that it's good enough, and with the benchmark of Donald Trump, of course it's better, but, but it's not good enough. Uh, and, uh, do you feel the same, that we've we're being so afraid of the future that we don't really have any ideas of what we want to do with it. Um, I think one of the tragedies, particularly in the last year or two, is that there is clearly, this is clearly a moment for real reform inside the European Union, for real changes in which it gets done. Um, but because of this succession of crises, um, some self-provoked, um, you know, the admission of Greece to the Euro in the first place was always a disastrous decision. That's, you know, we're now paying the price for that. But because of this series of crises, there's been no, people don't have the time or the energy um, to think, in, as you say, in a deeper and broader way about what Europe should become and how to make it more successful. Uh, one of the things I'm sorry about, particularly in the British debate, is that um, 
you know, the, the way that Cameron organized it. You know, there, there is a, there is a, there should be an argument, and there is a good argument that the British could make and could bring to Europe about ways to reform it and change it. But he, and, and you know, instead of being the person who could do that, he he went, you know, he went for this form of internal party management, which was to hold a referendum. But we keep losing the opportunity to make the real reforms. Um, NATO, funnily enough, you know, I was talking about reforming NATO 10 years ago, and everybody was bored and uninterested in the subject. It was considered sort of very marginal. Um, NATO, because of the pressure from Russia, is beginning to change a little bit. It's, um, you know, there is there are much much more serious conversations now about how it should really work. Um, where troops should be, are they in the right places? Do we have the right kinds of bases? Is our security structure really what it should be, given um, given the way the world looks? Um, and that's in a way that's because of pressure from Russia. It was it was, the, it was Russian pressure that made NATO change, um, and so that that's beginning to happen. I think it's too slow. Um, but but there are serious conversations inside NATO and inside the countries that still care about NATO uh, about changing the way it works. I gather there's some of those conversations in Sweden too. Yeah. But liberalism is often boring, boring. Because well, there is there is compromise is boring. Yeah. So when people complain about Swedish politics that it's boring, we should actually be quite happy about it. Because that's a sign that the democracy is working. But I think you mentioned Hatcher, Morgan Hatcher. And that is maybe a, a, a quite a significant historic example because in the set when you when, when europe and america came out of the 70s and all the crisis in the 70s and you mentioned that as well people were quite depressed and pessimistic and um what Tasha basically did was that she she offered revolutionary answer, answers she took out Friedrich Hayek's book from her, her bag and said, this is what we believe in. So that moved, she led a revolutionary movement. Uh, maybe she understood something about the mood, about the time. And maybe there is a lesson from the 70s and the beginning of the 80s to politicians today that if you want to attract a large audience, if you want to attract a large part of the electorate, you need to shout a little bit more. And this is worrying. I think history shows that maybe this is one of the reasons why why Margaret Thatcher was successful. Yes. Andreas Ekström, staff writer at Morning Paper, Südlandskam. Um, attaching to what you said, uh, why did the elites fail? Because partly because of overreach. I think the whole enterprise in the Middle East with the, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq was was overreach. So leaders of both the US and the UK not understanding the complexities, <laughs> once again, of the Middle East and the risks that was were associated with and with interventions in those places. Although I at the time actually I supported it myself. But I think that is a perceived incompetence, which also was, is real. Um, the financial crisis clearly showed that something was broken in our system. So, so where, who should you point at? The people who were in charge of it, the elites. I think the Panama Papers is actually quite damaging as well. Because that also sort of adds to the perception that there is a class at the global level, both from the democratic world and from the uh, not free world, that sort of is beyond rules, which is extremely damaging, I think, to the cohesion and the sense of level of trust in as our society. As far as the irony, sorry, the irony of that question is that I'm not sure that national elites were, you know, I think the point you just made is important. You know, I was trying to think, okay, the elites failed. Which elites? You know, elites, you know, the Swedish politicians? would discuss liberal self-criticism. I mean, when I say liberal, I mean liberal in the broader sense of the world. So the kind of liberalism that underpins the Western world. Uh, there is, maybe there is something in the, the global architecture that is missing. Um, something that was, actually that was lost with globalization. With uh, the, the European Union has, in a sense, been a way of trying to create that order. But it's just something that is starting to evolve, and, and we need actually. Well, I think part of the problem with the European Union is that 
is that people haven't let it lead, and have particularly foreign policy, particularly the security policy. Um, as I said, the, the, the really one of the most damaging moments of the refugee crisis was when Merkel suddenly appeared to make a unilateral decision that everybody else in Europe had to adapt to. I mean, that's not how Europe is supposed to work. Um, and there have been, interestingly, since the Lisbon Treaty was, designed, was signed, it was supposed to create common structures um, to, to, to do foreign policy. In fact, there's been a cycling back and a kind of renationalization uh, of European foreign policy. Uh, that it, was, it was almost as if we, we got close to creating something, and then people pulled back. And they've deliberately allowed the institutions of European foreign policy to remain weak. Uh, they've put people in charge of them who are, who are, who are not meant to have authority. Um, and there's been, a, there's been a pulling back. So there has been a failure to coalesce, and a failure uh, to speak as one. I mean, even, even a failure of you know, the sort of three or four leading European countries to speak as one. I mean, the British have been you know, doing their own thing, and the French have been focused on their own problems, and Germany is a country that doesn't traditionally think of itself as a foreign policy leader and is good at it. And so you've had this, um, you know, you've had this kind of mishmash for the last, particularly in the last two or three years. So, so the paradox is that people complain about the federal level not being effective enough, but they are not willing to not let not willing, not willing the federal to level be effective. Yeah. So how do you solve that? So nationalism becomes the answer. So now we have time for one more question, please. Um, hi, I'm Isabel Hadley Camps, I'm a liberal writer. I was wondering if what Anne said, that people are dissatisfied with democracy, freedom, open borders, prosperity, etc., and would rather have self-sacrifice, struggle, and death. <laughs> Is there anything we as democracies can give them that will satisfy that? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I mean, I think in the past we have done, you know, the United States has been very good at making arguments about, you know, democracy and why, you know, making a, um, you know, making democracy and the spread of democracy and the spread of liberal values into a kind of national project um, that kept Americans, you know, um, sort of, uh, what's the word, motivated. Uh, for many years, uh, we've had in the past. We had a, you know, Europe itself was created by people who were motivated to create Europe, and who felt that the creation of Europe, the creation of European institutions, you know, was a worthy goal and was a sort of, you know, something to aspire to that's greater than yourself. I mean, we have had national projects, a number of international projects and Western projects over the last couple of decades that do inspire people. Um, so it's not that it can't be done. Um, it's that it, it, you know, it is being done right now. And maybe the elephant in the room, actually, I haven't talked about it much because it's been, um, we've been on other subjects. But I mean, the fact that President Obama hasn't felt much like leading the world and hasn't felt much like playing the role of um, traditional American president. I mean, there, there are low energy. That there are many things about what he's done, and you can you, have, you can understand the appeal of some of his, and, and you can understand the logic of it. But I think he's he's. You know, with that loss of American energy, um, I think it's affected everybody else as well. I remember the accusation against Jeb Bush. Jeb Bush. Mm -hmm. Trump was was talking about it all the time. He's a low energy guy. He's a low energy guy. So that was an accusation. I think that applies, as, as you say, to Obama as well. That he doesn't feel passionate enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you.